So, as we head into the research area of the second floor, I've got some good news, and I've got a bit of bad news. The bad news is that, as we head into the research area proper, the monster does pretty much immediately spawn behind us, but the good news is... I have finally figured out how to attack. Now, if you're wondering how to do that, it's kind of not simple. We pretty much have to use the talk option whenever the monster is a certain range nearby. We also see that Kamiya here is running with a somewhat limited inventory of bullets. We also see, even worse, the monster is quick to get up. But after the vote we had in the thread, it seems the overwhelming feeling is that Kamiya is not really living up to expectations, and we should probably have him have a little dirt nap as well, so we are going to have him go ahead and get killed by the monster. But don't fret too much, we will be getting a new partner fairly soon. But first, we're going to elude the monster. And we're going to learn a little bit more about the research area. Because the information terminal is going to be pretty useful here. Namely, that's because the fact that the research area is a very complex area. At first sight, that is. Now we can go through, we see there are quite a few areas that may be of interest. Such as the western block here. It seems to be some working areas. And an eastern block, but more importantly we have another emergency elevator which could be of use. And a coolant control room. Not sure why we would need that, but it's good to keep in mind. Overall, though, you might recall that Leno told us to go look for some thieves, and I can only assume that they could be somewhere in the research area since he gave us the pass here. And there are a few possible areas where a thief could go, but I don't think they would want to go to the defense mechanisms. And I guess they could go to some labs, but my first inclination is to probably check that supply room. That seems the best place to keep stuff to steal. Still, though, for however complicated that map may look, what it doesn't initially tell you, and what is not immediately evident, is that that map includes the second floor of this area. Now, there is an upper floor, and that is going to be where the supply closet, or supply room, is going to be, so that is where we are going to head. And as you can probably guess, we don't have a lot of maneuvering room to get around the monster in this area. The good news is that we can't run off the edge here, but there are other environmental traps to be aware of. And as we do have a moment of rest here, this... Oh, oops, sorry. This weird texture on the ground is one of those environmental hazards. Now, it may not seem immediately evident, but once you get mo moving on this weird texture, you start to realize that you are now under the weird, bizarre physics of ice. 
Now, this is not immediately evident. This doesn't look like ice, but keep in mind that I'm really... I'm running right now, and the game is actively working against me, but... We want to try to solve that problem first, because we are going to be going through this this area quite a few times. And as you can probably guess, that is why the coolant room was marked off on the information center there. And while this is entirely optional to do, it will make things a little bit easier for us. Yeah, it looks like the coolant is kind of running rampant here and has frozen over most of the mechanism. And it mentions that we could probably get it moving with some tool. And we just so happen to have the tool that is necessary to beating this thing to pulp. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and turn that valve. And almost immediately, that has melted the ice that we would uh, normally be have to dealing with here. Also, since we are in the general area of the emergency elevator, we could probably go check on that. Though this particular bulkhead may seem similar. Yeah, this is pretty much the same type of bulkhead we saw back on the first floor. That would only go up whenever we disengage the emergency system. But we currently don't have a means to do that, so... We're just going to have to keep that in mind in case we do want to investigate that elevator. For right now, though, since we are on the second floor, where we want to be, we want to go ahead and make our way over to that supply room. The problem is that... Well, even though the the map isn't as complicated as it seems, it's still somewhat easy to get lost. A lot of things seem very samey up here, and... Well, there's a lot more dead ends than you might originally think. I mean, that, that map from the information, sec or information center makes it seem like everything is just very connected, but that's just because some of the second floor dead ends just kind of run right into the lower floors, so keep that in mind as I don't get massively lost here, but I probably do take a few unnecessary detours in trying to get to where we want to go. Still, it allows us plenty of opportunity to wonder just what type of research they kinda could have been doing here. This doesn't seem really inducive to research or not falling off to into a bottomless pit, but well, we finally made our way to the spy closet. After that action-packed scene, say hello to this personification of manliness known as Leroy Ivanov. Now, Leroy is not an entirely new character in the game. He does mention that he was part of that Strike Force team that we ran into very, very early on in the game that did try to kill us, which he is very 
apologetic for. Uh, it's just that the mission that he was given by the Japanese government was to take care of anybody that might have had contact with this quote-unquote hybrid. So this brings up a number of interesting facts, namely the fact that the hybrid can spread itself maybe through bodily contact as if it's some kind of virus, but also the fact that the Japanese government is in full knowledge of what's going on, which... I guess maybe this Imperial Army base wasn't so disused as we might have originally thought. The even better news is that this Leroy Ivanov is going to be our brand new partner. He decides that it's probably better to stick together, considering that most of his other men have been horribly mutilated by the monster. So, we get a non-sociopathic, just revenge-seeking Russian mercenary, so that'll be good. The thing is, though, that if we were looking for any kind of thief in this supply room, it doesn't look like we might have struck pay dirt here, but well, what's in this wooden box? <laughs> That is pretty bizarre. Guess it wouldn't hurt to maybe crack open this box and see what's inside, so might as well pull out that crowbar and give it another use. Or apparently the box is a lot tougher than it seems. I mean, it did survive all that fighting that was going on, so... Well, this isn't immediately obvious, but we have to use the sighing flute. I am not certain how you're supposed to suss out this puzzle. Maybe the fact that you heard moaning would make you think that sighing would somehow counterbalance it. It's not immediately clear, but we did manage to find one of the two thieves we were looking for, and out of the ether, Leno does appear to apprehend Miyaki here. And almost immediately, Miyaki does try to displace, you know, displace blame from himself onto Kojima. But Leno is a steadfast man, and he's going to have to deal with whatever law-breaking occurs down in the mesh. So he does take away Miyaki, but he does tell us to visit him in his office. And we will do that pretty shortly, but... There is one last thing I want to do real quick before we uh, we head to his office back in the livestock area. And the thing is, it's another situation where it probably is pretty easy to miss, but it's going to be very necessary. Also, uh, Ivanov really doesn't have anything important to say if you try to talk to him. He's just chilled to the bone by whatever horrible experiments that the Japanese might have been doing down here. But yeah, the one other thing I want to do while we are still in the research area is to head over, I think, to the western block. Getting a, Still getting a lot of use out of this great, great compass. There's something important in the offices over here. Oh. We do want to be a little careful. The patrols of the monster in this area are a little bit hard to peg down, but... By ducking into this office really quick, there isn't too much to investigate. Though we do get an unexpected visitor. Yeah, I'm wanting to say we met this guy back on the first floor of the mesh. I mean, his model at least looks similar to something we've seen before, but he does congratulate us on our good work in catching Miyaki. Not sure why his text is yellow. I assume that's just an oversight. But yeah, what we 
what we really came in here for is on the desk here. And if we go ahead and highlight that, we'll see that it is the top part of a torn pass. And you might recall from the last video in the livestock area, we did find the bottom portion of a torn pass, but as you can probably imagine, the central corridor doesn't really work so well with torn pieces of paper, so we're going to have to figure out some other means to get this pass to work in our favor. Which, surprisingly enough, is a problem that we can easily alleviate with another office that's right down the hallway. Just want to be careful because I'm not entirely certain the monster would have left the hallway so quickly. Yeah, the key to our pass problem is going to be located in this room, maybe in the storage box here. Or not. No, what's really of interest is this memo pad. Because somehow or another, our character manages to almost solve the puzzle for us by saying that maybe we could make this piece of cardboard into a pass. Though we do have to make a little jump in logic here. We need something to poke holes into the cardboard, and I guess the screwdriver works. So for our troubles, we do get a temporary fake pass. And normally I would be inclined to just go ahead and use that just to see where it takes us, but we really should head back to Leno's office and see what he has to offer us. And Leno still has the same rocking tune playing, as he is a badass sweeper. Still no idea what that means, but he's nice enough to congratulate us on our capturing of Miyaki, because I really doubt he would have been able to find him. But for our troubles, we do get a red card, which if you recall from the previous floor, this was the type of card that we could use to open up the security room. Also, for just coming back to check with him, he does offer us one piece of information regarding Kojima, and that is Kojima had a girlfriend once. Which... It doesn't seem like it's the most helpful hint in the world, but it is very, very necessary that you had to come back here. Now, it's not immediately evident but this game sometimes runs on a very strict setup of event queues. And while we do have that fake pass that we are heading back to the central corridor to use, and we could probably figure out where Kojima might be in this area coming up, we still had to come back to Lino here to get an event queue. But now that we are back at the central corridor, let's go ahead and use that fake pass and see where it takes us. Not that there are many options left for us to go, but you know, there has to be some air of mystery. Yep, this is our means of getting back to the residential area. And as you probably recall from the previous video, there is not a whole lot to the residential area. There was Rise, who as far as I can tell is a man and thus could not be a girlfriend for Kojima. And I think the one other person that we ran into this area was... I think it was Nice Makahari. And... Well, it's a bit hard to assume anything 
negative about someone that's labeled as nice, we really aren't given any other options or avenues of ways to go. I did make sure to double check just to make sure we couldn't get back up to the the first floor from here, but apparently the monster has welded the door shut, so that stairway, stairwell of death is no longer accessible to us, so... Really? I don't. Maybe we can get some more information from from Nice Makahari down here. So if we decide to talk to her, she doesn't really say. To what she says, nothing new. She does mention that everybody's a little jumpy. Maybe she's jumpy. It's hard to say. But what's of most interest here is the fact that we can now investigate this dresser. We couldn't do this before. It seems that Makahari is a bit up in arms about us invading her privacy, but... Well, we've been deputized by Leno, so... I think we have jurisdiction over her dresser. And somehow or another, our guests managed to pay off. So, when I was saying that you need to go trigger an event queue, uh, basically, we could come to this room beforehand and investigate the dresser beforehand, but we could not use the crowbar until we had went to talk to Leno, and he offhandedly mentioned that Kojima has a girlfriend that I guess we were supposed to assume was nice Makahari. It's... Well, it's tedious to say the least because what I'm cutting out is a lot of backtracking back to the livestock area and a bunch of unnecessary loading screens, but the good news is that we have now finished our little Dog the Bounty Hunter S side trip into apprehending these thieves of the mesh. And that means we do get another gift from Leno. And I think what's most important of all is that Nice Makahari is indeed nice enough to forgive us for apprehending her boyfriend and more than likely sending him to whatever justice Leno has for him. But we're going to go ahead and head right back to Leno's office because we have our final gift to get from him. And really, what he is going to give us now was our almost inevitable goal for this entire second floor. Now, it may be a bit hard to remember considering all these weird little side trips we've had to make and all this hunting and finding we've had to do for these two random people. But for our final bit of troubles, we do get access to the factory area. Now, if you're trying to remember who is in the factory area, we did talk to another person in the livestock area, and they mentioned that there was a guy in the factory area named Tetsuyo who was just great at fixing things. The problem is, before we head to the factory area, and in a very frustrating series of events, we do have to make a side trip to the research area yet again to visit a very familiar looking, very loud sci-fi room because we need to disactivate the security system on the second floor. It may not seem immediately evident why, but it's very important to do this nonetheless. Because with the security system now deactivated, that means that truthfully we shouldn't have we shouldn't really have to head to the factory area or talk to Tetsuyo because we now have access to that emergency elevator that was blocked off before by the bulkhead. And granted, the previous emergency elevator on the first floor was 
not really an accessible means to escape. It never hurts to investigate this emergency elevator and hope for something different. Though, if there's one thing I've learned from Dawn of War 2, it's that hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. Because, as we can pretty much tell immediately, this elevator is not in working condition. And in fact, if we look at the switchboard or switch box down here, it seems that someone has gone through the efforts of sabotaging this elevator. And, well, this is why we are inevitably going to need Tetsuyo and his mastery of mechanics. So now, we can safely head back to the central corridor and finally use our factory pass and see if we can't make our way over to Tetsuya. Factory is not at all what I would have expected. It's very dark. It's very foreboding. It even comes with a few odd music stings here and there, but well, before we go running around here getting lost, there is an information center located right at the start. And, in comparison to the research area that we might have had troubles with before, the factory area initially seems a lot simpler. I mean, there's a lot less areas to possibly get lost in. There's no second floor. And if we scroll through the options of things to look at here, well, most of the map is just this supply room in the center. The thing is that in the description here, you'll notice that it says automated conveyor belts. And those are going to be the main point of contention if you are trying to navigate through the center of the map here. It also has a northern and southern, I think, living quarters. But really, our main focus here is this automated factory. And it just seems like the reasonable place for someone that's into repairing electronics and, you know, machines might be. So, I guess that is where we want to end up heading. But in comparison to most of the other portions of the second floor, the factory is probably the most dangerous for a number of reasons. Namely, once we just start our way into the, uh, the factory proper here, well, you want to be careful with which way you go. because there are quite a few possible places for the monster to just be hanging out on the ceiling waiting to drop down on you. And the bad news is that even if we did manage to have Naomi still at this point, she would not give us any type of warning outside of maybe showing it on the map, but get our first little trip on a conveyor belt here. Not not too bad, though it is it is a one-way trip. Just so happens, though, that that one-way trip is leading us where we want to go, even though there is nothing at all in the environment to, to really hint at that. But one of the other reasons that you did want to head down here and active, disactivate the security system is because these gates here 
will only open if you have deactivated the security. Otherwise, you would not be able to get to this little fork in the road here. And if you weren't able to reach the fork in the road here, well, you wouldn't be able to get to that automated factory. Where we can meet Robot Freak Tetsuyo. Not what I would have, uh, not what I would have pictured initially. Very, very much perplexed by the, the character design still. Especially, it looks like he's wearing a shirt of raw meat. But, uh, by, by helping Suguya earlier, back on the first floor with his headphones, uh, Tetsuyo is nice to us here. And he decides that he will offer us help in whatever we might need. This is another circumstance where hopefully you hit some event cues because otherwise you would be a bit fucked. Because if you didn't learn about the fact that the elevator switch needed fixing, you would tell Tetsuyo here about your situation about being stuck and all he would say is, hey, did you know there was an elevator in the research area? Which means you would have to backtrack all the way through the factory, back to the research area to go look at the elevator, only to retrace your steps back here and talk to him yet again so he would finally go fix the elevator. But with him now gone to fix the elevator, we are not entirely done in the factory just yet. We don't have too much further to go. There's pretty much uh, three upper arms to the factory area here. We want to go to the next one over, I think. And man, I am I am done trying to side sidestep this guy. So it's now time to see what Leroy Ivanov does. That's right, Leroy is still packing his bizarre grenade flamethrower launcher weapon. And even though it's pretty visually impressive in the cutscene, it, it sadly only stuns the enemy, but as far as I know, it does have more ammo than Kamiya's weapon, so... An upgrade is an upgrade. And this bizarre... Thing, I assume it to be a gentleman, is the one other person that we wanted to talk to in the factory, though I I almost regret it immediately with his... I don't even want to say it's a weird form of talking. I assume he's supposed to be a hip-hop happening man of the people that's uh, got the finger on the pulse of current popular culture or something. I, I don't know. He's, uh, he's soulful Stu Tao, so he, he doesn't seem like much initially outside of one of many, many weird, pointless NPCs that populate the mesh, but he does have something important to give us, and it's something that is probably very easy to miss. But he does mention it's odd that we want to go down to the Great Hall of the Holy Ring, but... Uh, he was noticing that one of the Holy Ring guys, when they were getting in and out of an elevator, ended up dropping something strange. And it doesn't seem to work in his CD player, so he figures, hey, why not give it to us? Th thanks for this soulful sutao. So... We are finally pretty much all done on the second floor here. I think we we should have a means to use that elevator. The bad news is that we are a really long, long way from uh, from leaving this floor. 
And that brings up one of the main problems I have with this particular area of the game. No, it's not the monster, because we have a solution for that. I can't even begin to describe, one, the fact that most people seem to want to keep Naomi over the gun-wielding people, and two, I am very appreciative that people in the thread decide to get rid of Kamiya because we would miss out on the Russian wielding the grenade launcher. But, going back to what I was originally saying, this long hallway here, it's pretty much circumventing everything in the level. We have just skipped all that conveyor belt nonsense in the center, and there was nothing stopping us from taking this as a means to get up to Soulful Sutao or Robot Freak Tetsuyo. At most, we might have run into the monster and maybe been kind of stuck. Maybe? But yeah, we can just get around all that central conveyor belt nonsense. And you might be saying, well, maybe the doors would have stopped you, and that's true, the doors would have stopped me, but they would have also stopped me from seeing Tetsuyo, and thus making this entire journey even more pointless. So maybe it was to penalize players for not looking at the information center and seeing that other hallway, but well, we don't have to worry about that anymore because we're gonna ride this elevator and see where it takes us. And if you were initially worried that we would have to do some additional fetch quest, the good news is Robot Freak Tetsuyo is pretty competent and he just magically fixes the elevator. So, that's good, because I am very tired of the second floor at this point. And what's even better is that for some reason or another, the elevator only goes up, which means that we don't have to go deeper into this horrible Tokyo mesh, we don't have to deal with this monster anymore, we can finally get out of here. So, as we... As we tip our hats to Tetsuyo and thank him for a good job of not making us search out some switch box, we do get one last option of whether or not we want to ride on the elevator. I guess it's in case the bizarre possibility that you just love the second floor or maybe you didn't pick up that CD-ROM, but well, we are done here, so on to the elevator. 